Good morning. A couple weeks ago, well, a couple months ago, Diane said, I need you to go to Milan. I need you to go and present in Milan. And I was like, hey, Diane, anything you want, I am happy to do that for you. I will do that for you anywhere you want me to go. And my daughters asked me where I go, and I said, my friend Diane wants me to go to Milan and present. And then they said, Dad, it's Fashion Week. My daughters, teenage daughters, they said, it's Fashion Week. They said, it's really important. You need to be really plugged in. And I said, honey, I am a short, pudgy, not that attractive looking man. They don't want me in Fashion Week. And they said, Dad, you have to be prepared for Fashion Week. This is not a Fashion Week audience. But thank you for coming. <laughs> it's great to be here. I've had a chance to speak at, I think, almost every one of these uh, since way back in the very beginning when it was about two rows of people or what would be the equivalent of that. Um, so it's exciting for us to see this grow every single time. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, hybrid cloud, open hybrid cloud, and what all that means. And, and as Diane mentioned, um, number one, we may have a little bit of a language barrier, so I'll try and break that down a little bit. But also, it kind of gets wrapped up in this idea of lots of marketing terms. So I'm going to try and put it in the context for us that is very realistic, right? And I think it's important to sort of be realistic because we are here during Fashion Week in which the world is very much about trends that last for three months or two months. We throw them away. They're not, they're not long lasting. They're about things that are sort of superficial. And we're trying to help you build some things that ultimately are going to last for a long time for your company that you can build upon, that you can not have to necessarily you know, change it because of the whims of whatever the latest fashion is. Ultimately, you know, when we talk about hybrid cloud, I think it boils down to a lot of real simple things, maybe not so much buzzwords, but basically everybody sort of walks in the room and they go, look, I have two problems I'm trying to solve. And to a certain extent, I'm trying to solve them at the same time. It's the classic sort of you know, two variable problem. You know, one is my business would like to create growth. We'd like to move into new areas. We'd like to take on new opportunities. We want to drive profitability, whatever that might be. And at the same time, we're also trying to figure out how do we prioritize things where we may want to take cost out of the system. We may want to reduce costs. We may want to automate things. And ultimately, we're always sort of, you know, this small bird here trying to figure out which one do I, which one do I focus on. And in some cases, you come and you go, you know what, my job is all about growth. I don't care about saving cost. And that's great. There's a place in this conversation for you. And there are others in the room who go, look, we, we have to take 20% out of this. That, uh, amongst all the other fancy things you're going to tell me, I still need to take 20% of the system or whatever that number is. And there's room in this conversation for you as well. So let's break this down. So what is open? If you've ever come to a Red Hat event, you know we sort of, as Diane mentioned, we sort of take this open thing fairly seriously. Um, to us, it's, it's not just open source. It really is thinking about open in the context of community, in the context of transparency. But more importantly, it's about the realization that if we believe for any reason that we have all the answers to solve your problems, we're out of our mind. And so it's interesting to us to see more and more of the industry start to sort of embrace open, but open in sort of a what's in their best interest open, right? Open in the sense of like, yes, we contribute to a project, but it's our project, right? And we sort of believe in this idea that open around open hybrid cloud is about being open all the time. It's the idea that, um, <clears throat> and again, having spoken at a lot of these events over the last three plus years, I'm always amazed when uh, the companies that come up and tell their story come up. I get a chance to go, most of my job is to go around and, 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 and interact with customers um, at some point in time. And I feel like I have a fairly good grasp of things. And then I come to this event every three months or whatever it is. And the stories that companies tell about what they do on top of OpenShift and what you'll see, and this is something to sort of keep in mind, yes, the, the baseline technology they use is OpenShift, but the things they do on top of that are all things that simply just work or they figured out how to make work because the technology that was out there was open, because they were able to go and get in contact with people in the community and say, how do I make this Kafka thing work on Kubernetes because OpenShift happens to be Kubernetes because we have this streaming application that we'd like to do because we're going to do whatever, right? Or whatever the application is. 
And so that idea of openness, and I think that's what attracts people to both events like this, but also to working with Red Hat, is this idea that they're going to provide me a stable baseline of technology. They're going to help make sure that, you know, kind of the latest things that are in Diane's diagrams are going to get into these platforms that we use, but I don't have to rely on them. They're not my bottleneck. And for us, that's a really big deal. That's a part of not only our culture, but we think it's something that, that attracts people to working with us and with the communities that we work in. Now, um, for those of you in the back, I want you to cover one of your eyes and read from the left and just tell me what these are. This is this wonderful diagram that the CNCF puts together. How many of you have ever seen this before? You've heard of this thing? So the Cloud Native Computing Foundation uh, is a great organization. They do a lot of the governance for the open source projects that are around this space, Kubernetes and others. And <coughs> they, when they first got started, they had to kind of convince the world that Cloud Native was a thing, or it's going to be like an important thing. So what they went out and they did, and this is sort of the origin of this, is they worked with a couple of the VC firms that invest in lots of things, and they said, where's all the money going? Where's all the projects? And they started building this thing. And it's a wonderful map. It you know, sort of gives you a sense of what's going on out there. And it's also something where you go, oh my goodness, what in the world do I pick? What do I learn? Where do I spend my free time? How do I figure out which of these things, like for example, of the, I don't know, 12 or so API gateways, which one should we use? Which project is viable? Which one has the best features? Which one is some crazy idea out of a, out of a, a, a garage? And which one is, is the next thing? And what we try and do as Red Hat is we sort of, um, we're kind of an early warning system, sort of a canary in the coal mine, if you will, of saying, look, we're going to put the effort in to, to live in these communities, to live in these projects, to put people into the projects, to work on them, and hopefully, provide some sanity, right? Provide some sort of enterprise perspective on where these things are going. And not every single one of these by any means will get into OpenShift. Many of these won't make it. That's the reality of our industry. But many of these will get better because we bring your voice to how we contribute to these. You give us your feedback on which one of these you would like to see prioritized in OpenShift or better integrated with something else you're doing. But this is kind of the reality we have. It's, it's thousands and thousands of projects, and at some point you have to whittle that down and narrow that down into something that you can use for your business. That's the beauty of open, right? It's unlimited amounts of innovation, right? Tons and tons of venture capital are going into here so new ideas can, can come to, to market. But then the reality is you have to figure out how do we use those for ourselves, right? And that yin and yang is just like that little bird. You're trying to figure out what's important, what's cool and exciting, and which one makes sense for us. So what we try and do as a part of that beyond the technology is we try and make sure that when you need to go learn things, we make that as simple as possible. So for things like learn.openshift.com, which have any of you ever been to learn.openshift.com? So write that down, easy to remember. Totally free ways of going, I would just like to learn something about this stuff I learned today. I want to learn about containers. I want to learn about operators. I would like to play with whatever it might be. And oh, by the way, maybe I don't have an environment. That's fine. You need a laptop, you need a browser, fully uh, sort of hands-on, interactive, self-driven learning modules. These things are available to you. Because we want to make sure that as new cool stuff comes along, whether you're going to put them into, into production or into testing in your environment today, you still want to get ahead of the learning curve, right? Make yourself the smartest person in the room. The other thing that we've invested in around open is very much this idea that while the technology is very cool, Kubernetes is neat and Service Mesh is neat and Knative is neat and blah, 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 at some point you have to figure out like, um, we're a traditional organization. You talked about this idea of blameless postmortems. My boss has no idea what the word blameless means. My boss loves the word blameless, blameful. He likes to point the finger at things. How do we take this idea of doing stuff like that? How do we do DevOps, which is this idea that we're just going to keep moving things along. We're going to keep integrating things. We don't necessarily have to have outage windows. How are we going to do that? And so we've spent a lot of time investing in these things that we call Red Hat Open Innovation Labs, which again are ideas of how do we help you not only learn the technology, but learn sort of how do we live in these sort of cultures of rapidly building software, of dealing with 
distributed systems that are going to fail? How do we, you know, how do we deal with those? Um, and there are things that not only you can come and work with us directly, but we come out and work with you as well. So we've tried to bring this idea of learnings that we get from the community, put them into systems that can be kind of packaged up, if you will, um, and, and go and work with you both on the technology side and the culture side. Okay, so that's kind of the hybrid, the, the open piece of it. So what about hybrid? So when we think about hybrid, if you go back a decade, and I was involved with this a decade ago, Originally, when we talked about hybrid as vendors, it was really kind of a, a reactionary thing to when the public cloud came out, and we all went, uh-oh. If everybody likes the public cloud, essentially public cloud is bypassing IT, and that's not necessarily a good thing. So we will create this thing that says, hey, why can't you just do what you can do on premises somewhere in the public cloud or somewhere else, and all will be good. And we've gone through about 10 years or so of gyrations of what does that really mean in reality, and is it based on you know, these hardware stacks, is it based on software, do we have a standard we can use for getting there? <clears throat> and I think throughout that iteration, the other thing we sort of realized is that most of your businesses in one way, shape, or form ultimately work in some sort of hybrid mode, right? So you've got pieces of what you do that tend to be sort of physical or direct, the way you interact with the marketplace. Uh, there's pieces of it that are going to be sort of digital engagement. Right? You're interacting with your customers, but it's through some sort of third-party interface. It's ride-sharing, it's you know, mobile app. And the third part is you're going to deal with some sort of marketplace or API. There's very little that you do directly anymore. A lot of it's through these things. So if we look at this as an example, if I take banking or finance, for example, yes, there are still bank buildings. There are still branch offices. There are still ATMs. Right? There's still a physical aspect of what we do. Um, but there's also marketplaces that we interact with. There are also you know, sort of digital inter interactions that we have, mobile banking and so forth. Those things are the realities of what we do. And as a business, you're sitting there saying, which one of these do we invest more in? Which one of these do we have a competitive advantage in? And the reality is the way that you're going to deliver applications, deliver computing, deliver security and so forth, isn't necessarily one size fits all. And it sort of backs itself into this idea that having an ability to be hybrid whatever percentage that might be, and the ability to say, hey, the business might change that percentage over time, becomes really important. And we can kind of apply this to other industries as well. We can apply it to the car buying process, whether you're going to a dealership, you're you know, ride sharing, you're buying through some sort of marketplace. You begin to think of it as the way that you're going to build those systems behind the scenes are going to have to have some fluidity in terms of what you're dealing with. And we see this in lots of different markets. It's not just location matters, it's not just the physical thing matters, but also things like, you know, is the people that I'm working with, you know, 10 years ago GDPR didn't exist. We didn't have to think about locality in that sense. Uh, five years ago, Amazon didn't own grocery stores. So if you were a grocery store five years ago, maybe you said, hey, Amazon's fine, we'll all work with, and now you say, well, do I want to pump my profits into AWS because that now competes directly against me, and the dynamics of how we deal with the industry gets sort of different, right? Um, and those things will continue to evolve over time. So the hybrid piece of this is you're going to walk away going, I know that some sort of change in my business is coming. I don't necessarily know when. I don't necessarily know the impact of it. And you're always sort of balancing that against what do I need to do today? What's my immediate thing? Do I invest in the future? What do I need to do today? And hybrid is essentially that, call it an insurance policy, call it a flexibility aspect that you're saying, I know these are the dynamics of what I have to deal with, but do I have the flexibility in the architecture I'm building to, to do that or to do that in the future? So what is cloud? All right, dummy. I'm going to try and explain cloud to all of you smart folks. All right. So I'm going to give you cloud in the sense of what, what we've sort of learned over the last five years. So OpenShift has been a platform that, for many of you, has been around for a number of years. How many of you Remember OpenShift before it was Kubernetes? Were any of you involved with that back in version 2? Okay, a few of you. How many of you are open sh actually use OpenShift today as a version 3 or something? Okay, and then some that are new. So we've learned quite a bit about this. We've run OpenShift as a managed cloud platform over the years. We've delivered, we've delivered OpenShift as software that runs in things that you can run yourself, but that they run in lots of different places. And there's been a lot of learnings that we've gotten having lived in both of those worlds and having to live in what, does it seem, what is it like to 
run and manage software that's in corporate data centers that are essentially snowflakes? What is it like to run them in public clouds that are very API driven? And then start to realize that every public cloud is a little bit different. Azure storage is a little bit different than AWS storage is different than Google storage and so on and so forth. And so we've learned a lot of things. We've learned that not every public cloud's the same. They're fantastic in what they do, but they're not exactly the same. And so somewhere, somebody has to figure out how do you translate how you do authentication in one world to another world? How do you figure out how to map to storage that's a little bit different in different places, or pricing is a little bit different? Um, <coughs> we've learned that in order to be successful, to have a successful platform that people want to come back to, you've got to be able to work with a lot of different applications. Right? And this was one of the learnings that we had from the early Kubernetes days, where everything was going to be cloud native and everything was going to be stateless. And at some point, somebody raised their hand and said, uh, where does the state go? Like, how do I deal with the data part of this? It can't all be stateless. Um, and so we've had to learn from that. And now today, we're going to talk about AI and ML and a whole bunch of other things running on top of Kubernetes that five years ago, you never would have thought of. It was just going to be a bunch of stateful web apps that were going to scale like Google. Okay. Um, and there's a lot of things that we've learned. We've learned that inconsistency drives up cost. We've learned that inconsistency drives up complexity. Uh, that integrations are complicated to maintain. People ask us all the time, you know, why can't I just build this stuff myself, right? It's just Kubernetes. It's just out there for free. And then you go back to that slide a few pictures ago that was the eye chart, and you go, oh yeah, I'm going to integrate a whole bunch of those things. And oh yeah, it comes out every three months. And oh yeah, it's not always backwards compatible. So how do I deal with that? Um, so we've learned a whole bunch of things. And from those learnings, we've kind of boiled a lot of those things down to a couple of basic things, right? We know that as much as possible, we have to automate operations. And we can't necessarily rely on just some tool to do that for us. We kind of have to bake that into the architecture. We know that standards, interoperability, portability are incredibly important to you, right? Um, there's a reason why even though, as Diane mentioned, OpenShift does things above and beyond Kubernetes, everything that we do is first and foremost contributed to Kubernetes, and first and foremost makes sure that it doesn't break anything in Kubernetes. So that when Amadeus or Sia or anybody else comes along and says, I have an application I want to build, they know in the back of their mind, this will just work on, on Kubernetes. The OpenShift piece just makes it easier for us to manage. Right? So we have to make sure we do that. We have to make sure that as much as possible, we make it such that things are on demand, right? Whether you deliver those on demand, they're built into the platform is on demand, but also that you can get to the marketplace of ideas and technology that's out there. Make that as simple as possible. You'll see those things integrated in the platform. Um, we want to make sure that it's continuously secure. Nobody wants to be on the front page of the Wall Street Journal or your local paper on the front page of Hacker News going, that dummy didn't integrate that feed that that CVE. We want to make sure that there is a mechanism to keep the platform continuously secure, sort of secure by default, and then continuously secure. And then finally, we want to make sure that it supports a broad set of applications. And there are lots of other considerations that we find a lot of this boils down to that. And this is ultimately kind of what we've tried to evolve OpenShift 4 to. So for those of you that are new to OpenShift, um, for the last four or so years, we've had a platform called OpenShift 3. It was the first one we had based on Kubernetes. We just, as of May of this year, released what we call OpenShift 4. Really, a lot of the same capabilities, but a completely uh, more modernized architecture around that. I'm going to talk about a little bit of that. We're going to dive into a lot more of it throughout the day. <coughs> so this is sort of our vision for where we're going with OpenShift 4. Um, We've always delivered OpenShift. We've always believed, even though Kubernetes and containers are sort of at the core of what we do, we've always believed that in order for us to help customers be successful in deploying applications and ultimately making their business better, which is the business that you're in. We're in the business of building platforms. You're in the business of, of uh, satisfying your customers in various ways. Uh, we needed to, to sort of deliver it as a complete, pat, uh, complete pat platform. That means we package a lot of things together, but it also means we integrate a lot of things. So you'll always see us sort of lay this out as somewhat of a stack diagram, but think about this as, as the entire experience from automated infrastructure, secure infrastructure, cluster services to allow you to scale this, application services to allow you to bring a lot of different types of applications to it, 
and then developer services in order to allow your developers to just write code, continue to write code and, and be successful doing that. So our belief is we would like to be the de facto hybrid cloud platform for the enterprise. I know that's a lot of marketing words and buzzwords in there. Um, our belief is in order to do that, there's a couple of things that we're going to have to do. The first is <clears throat> because we're talking about the enterprise and because we're talking about large scale organizations, we've got to be able to bring the power of OpenShift um, as a cluster, as a place where you run this into a more holistic view of things. And so you will see us do quite a bit of work around essentially federating uh, your clusters regardless of where they run. It's one of the powers of, of OpenShift is you're going to run consistently everywhere. Um, you're going to see us deliver a more sophisticated way of doing software updates. Uh, one of the great challenges that people have told us with earlier versions of OpenShift was um, it's great that you're giving me new functionality. It's great that the community is moving fast. We are an enterprise. We're not used to doing updates every three months. You better make this simpler for us. We would like the power of what comes out of Kubernetes, but we don't necessarily like the pain of it. So you'll see a lot of work that goes on about making the update process more simplified. That also allows us to get a little more information about what's going on with these things, right? Um, we call it telemetry. We'll talk about it more throughout the day. But I'll give you just one sort of thing to keep in the back of your mind. So if you start playing with the new version of OpenShift, OpenShift 4, so if you go out to try.openshift.com. You can go play with the bits at any point in time. One of the things is it says, hey, um, we are going to collect a little bit of telemetry information about what's going on in your cluster. And none of that is the data that you deal with. None of it is things that you have to be worried about in terms of privacy. It's basically where are they running it? So we have some sense of where you want to run the platform. But it also gives us a sense of like, what's the health of the things running under the covers in the platform? Just a quick data point. So we fix hundreds of bugs every release that go in. We implement dozens of CVEs throughout. 20% over the this is over the last just couple of months. 20% of the CVEs and bugs that we have found have come via that automated telemetry. So we are able now, in working sort of uh, cooperatively with you with your clusters, to make the product better on a more automated basis. And that's something that we want to be able to deliver to you. We know the software is moving quickly. We know the innovation's coming quickly. We want to make sure that we're doing things on a proactive basis. We're actually now able to reach out to customers ahead of time and say, hey, your clusters are in somewhat of a state that you may want to start paying attention to more. And we're starting to see that on a more proactive basis. Um, we want to deliver a great hybrid cloud experience for both your devs and your ops. One of the great questions that people ask all the time is, who needs this? Who uses this? And the reality is, while it may just be your developers that think they use the platform, there is an aspect of this that the operators have to have a say in what's going on. This touches the security team. It touches networking and storage and monitoring and logging and all those things. And so there has to be elements of this that make the balance between building software faster and more secure and running the platform. And so there's a number of things that we've been doing around this. There you go. One of them that we'll talk about a lot today, how many of you have heard of this concept called operators? Right? How many of you heard of um, Amazon RDS or Amazon S3, something as a service? Right? Operators is, in essence, the instantiation of software as a service that you run in your platform. We want to make anything that you run internal to the platform and, more increasingly, the software you run on top of the platform not only be highly automated, but have a lifecycle built around it, and be sort of Kubernetes native, if you will, in terms of understanding how to take advantage of the advanced things that happen. So we've been doing a lot of work around that. Um, you can find that, as Diane mentioned, out on Operator Hub. That's the community place that you can find this, operatorhub.io. Um, all of that gets embedded now into OpenShift 4. So all the things going on in the community around operators, and you'll see it's becoming very broad, now become just part of your marketplace that you can offer to your internal teams. The second part is we're giving a ton more visibility to the operational side of the platform. So whether it's metering, monitoring, chargeback, just cluster health, again, I talked about telemetry, your operational teams will have much more visibility as to what's going on. And this is, again, us integrating things like Prometheus, Grafana, uh, Kiali, also, you know, Jaeger, all sorts of things but again, making this things that are just natively built into the platform. You don't have to think about plugging in some other third-party tool to do that. Um, 
we're beginning to take more advanced types of technology. We're going to talk about service mesh later, but advanced things around distributed applications, around cloud native applications, and embedding those into the platform. So technologies like Istio and service mesh are now just first class sort of features within the platform. Things like serverless, Knative, William's going to talk more about this. You know, the ability to build functions as a service, right? The platform has been containers as a service. It's been, it does sort of platform as a service, if you will. It also now embeds functions as a service as essentially a first class feature of the platform as well. We want you to be able to bring that broad set of applications to the platform. <clears throat> and we also want you to be able to, you know, build around the idea that it's not just about the application, but it's about the pipeline for that application. How do we build it securely? And as Kubernetes evolved and people better understand Kubernetes, how do we start to build those pipelines, our software pipelines, our CI, CD pipelines around natively the capabilities of the platform? So you will see more Kubernetes native CI, CD pipelines uh, becoming a native part of the platform as well. So again, trying to give your operations teams, the tooling and visibility they need to what's going on, and begin to give your developers the foundation for <clears throat> a lot of flexibility in the platform. Now, finally, in terms of experience for developers, you know, we've always, we've always had this yin and yang in terms of the development experience of OpenShift. There is, there is a, a terminology out there called opinionated, and people will say, well, I would like an opinionated experience. I would like my developers to all sort of conform to this one way of building software. It was very much the way that when we were doing things in the PaaS days, so when it was PaaS OpenShift, OpenShift version two, Cloud Foundry did this, Heroku's done this for a while. We're going to give you specific guardrails for your developers. As long as they stay within those guardrails, it will be an incredible experience and you can go from there. The great part about that is you can train your developers and you can build tooling around one experience. The downside of that is as soon as you want to do anything outside of those guardrails or that box, things sort of break, right? And so we've always sort of come back to this mantra that we want to be flexible for developers. We want to be opinionated in certain ways and we want to be flexible in certain ways. And so what you've seen us do over time is we've sort of said there will be native tools for the platform. So whether those are CLI tools, whether those are integrated web-based IDE tools, and we'll talk more about those today. Um, in some cases, people say, I don't want to deal with any of your stuff. I just want you to plug into the things that I love. So VS Code and JetBrains and others, we can plug into those as well. And then more and more, we're beginning to see this sort of trend called GitOps, where people say, you know what? Pfft, everything should live in Git. Git's my single source of truth, and I'd like you to drive all of the interactions through Git and we're beginning to work around that space as well. There's some very interesting tooling that's coming there. So from a developer perspective, and we're gonna talk about this more throughout the day, we've always had the mindset that your developers are all going to be a little bit unique, or company to company, they're gonna be a little bit unique. We wanna be able to give you opinionated views on that in certain lanes, but we also realize that you're going to have developers that are comfortable with the tools they're comfortable with, and we don't want to limit them from being able to do that. So you will see us sort of have multiple developer experiences. The end goal is ultimately build code, push it through, uh, push it through automated pipelines, automated testing, get it into the platforms that can be highly automated, but the path to get there, the sort of supply chain to get there sometimes will be a little bit different depending on what you're trying to drive for your developers. So with that, I'm going to kind of wrap it up today for my first talk. Um, I'll be around all, all day if you want to ask questions, but the thing that I'll ask you, and I'll, I'll kind of leave this as an open-ended question, as you're thinking about your journey, as you're thinking about what you're trying to build, as you're trying to think about what you're learning today, where are you when you come in the room? There's going to be a ton of really interesting information. You're going to learn from the development teams that are building this. You're going to hear from some people that have been working with us for a number of years and some that are very new. Take advantage of it. This is a great chance to learn. The person next to you may have five years of experience of things that you want to learn about, like Diane mentioned. Um, we hope we're giving you a platform that is really robust, that helps solve your needs. If we're not, please come talk to us. Um, we, if nothing else, we listen very well. Um, and because, like we mentioned, um, it's a very open platform. The idea that we can evolve this thing together is, uh, is very possible. So thank you for your time. Look forward to a great day. And uh, I think William is up next. All right.